Uh, kia ora everyone, ko Andrew Veal, um, toko ingoa. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things that I've been working on in terms of stoats and genetics and hopefully some of it's interesting. I'm largely not going to be talking about most of the stuff that Fred Free has funded, which is talking, uh, which is my research on uh, manipulating their reproduction. Uh, and it will be other things that I currently actually have results for. Uh, something that happened last year, which was uh, very fun, we got basically everyone that works on stoats in the country together at Te Papa, and we had a big meeting talking about, well, what do we know and what don't we know? And I foolishly said, that sounds like something that should be written up. I'll do it. <laughs> and it was uh, not, not the most directional of meetings, uh, but there is a very, very large document of about 40,000 words that soon, hopefully, you will all see once it's published, uh, saying what we know and don't know. Does it have a crazy? Uh, the, the, the main takeaway is that we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So that, and, and it's really fun trying to work with this many authors and get them to all agree on the wordings of things and what we know and don't know. So one of the first things that I put in this was uh, islands. We can get stoats off islands and we have been trying to for a while. These are the larger islands in New Zealand that we have tried to eradicate stoats from. And what I did here was I took every trap location and then the color is the distance from those traps. So obviously on, say, Waiheke Island, most of the island is very close to a trap. Uh, Resolution Secretary, there's parts that are further away. Now, does this matter or not? Now... These are the ones that have succeeded. They're the small ones. So we have succeeded in eradicating stoats from islands below 1,200 hectares. So 1,200 hectares. Everything larger than that, we've failed. Some of these have cost more than $10 million and been going for over 10 years and have failed. And that's because we can't actually eradicate stoats on large islands with traps alone. Uh, Waiheke is the current attempt, and I'm going to get into that one in a lot of detail, uh, but we're hopeful that it's possible, but it may not be. Uh, there have been islands larger than this, so Rangatoto Matatapu, but we wiped that clean with Brody. That works. Um, so, yeah, the conclusions of all of this were small islands we can get rid of uh, all the soaps with traps, but for instance, one of the larger ones, Anchor Island, there were 18 stoats total on it. So if you have enough traps, you'll eventually get all of them. Uh, but once you get to larger and larger islands, it gets very hard to get all of them because there's just some that will avoid. And if you have enough that avoid, you don't succeed in eradication. Eradication is different from control. And that's a really important thing to remember, and I will emphasize this multiple times throughout. What most of you are doing is control, Eradication is completely different, and it requires something completely different. So, a control operation that I have done some analyses on was Project Young Zoom. Uh, this is Abel Tasman National Park, and they have over 3,000 doc, oh, doc series traps. There's a mix of 150s and 200s, over 19,000 hectares, and every second year they do a 1080 drop. That's really good pest control. Now, I did a lot of analyses on this with my colleague Andrew Gormley, and uh, so these are some of the results which I thought would be useful to you, because most of you are in the control space, not the eradication space. So, single trap alone does catch more than a double set, or half a double set, but overall, double sets do catch more. Uh, the best baits were erased block and egg mayo, though the thing is that you have to remember with what is the best bait, it is probably habitat dependent and also trap check interval dependent. So if you're checking your traps every day, then probably fresh rabbit's great. Fresh rabbit's not so great after three months. It raises slightly better. So, you know, you have to remember what bait it is is very dependent on a number of factors. But strangely enough, one of the best ones, it was about equal, was no bait at all. 
in run-through tracks, a double set run-through in a really good environment actually works very well because Stokes will run through because it's a tunnel. And so this is one of the confounding factors. And actually in the UK, a lot of gamekeepers, they just have unbated tracks in really good natural little tunnels and they have very good uh, outcomes. You can't always do that. Um, and there was, uh, so mustelids were drawn to traps with rats in them for double sets. Uh, predicting clogging. Um, in this environment, you have very, very high rats in autumn, particularly at low altitudes, and you do get a lot of the traps just filled with dead rats. Uh, so that was an interesting issue that we saw. But how much trap clogging matters? Uh, we did a model for the stoke population and up to 45% clogging rate was still probably not going to make much of a difference for the stoats in that environment. But we recommended about 25% saturation. So if you have a program and less than uh, a quarter of your traps are filled with your trap check interval, it's probably fine. It's not going to affect the number of stoats that you catch. That's a really nice thing to know. And their saturation rate throughout most of the year, most of the habitat was 14%, so no cause for alarm. There were edge effects. Uh, so on the edge, you caught a lot more stoats. Um, and obviously that's because you know, they are new ones that are moving into that area. And this was particularly in summer. And it was a slightly different pattern in spring. And so I think that what was happening there was that in spring, males extend their ranges looking for females. And in summer, you get the dispersal of juveniles. So that was useful. But the thing is that you start looking at the uh, x-axis on this, and we're talking kilometers. So that's how far the stokes are moving into a trap area. Um, I know I go through things very quickly, but hopefully you take some in. Um, so probably from this, there was over a million trap nights, the analysis that I did. Doc 200s were better than 150s um, in catching stoats. Uh, egg mayo in a race, but uh, um, double set run through is good. And pro clogging, probably not an issue, and edge effects. But the toxin application was incredibly important to their stuff. And the other thing that I, because I presented this information to them, I said, oh, but some of our robins and the kakari aren't doing so well. It's like, that's a shipwreck issue. You always have to remember what is your target species compared. So if you're talking about kiwi chick survival, it's stoats and parrots. If you're talking about kaka, it is stoats, only stoats. And that's why Waikiki is having huge numbers of kaka coming, because the stoats are very low. If you're talking about small passerines, you're talking about ship rats and stoats. So try and optimize for both of those species if that's what you are trying to target. Now, getting on to uh, stoats genome. So uh, I led the Stoke Genome Sequencing, and we now have that online. Anyone wants to check it out, you can look at lots of ASTs, Gs, and Cs. Um, and it is one of the highest quality <coughs> sorry, genomes in the world. And that's because we threw vast amounts of money at it. And with modern sequencing technologies, if you get high enough sequencing coverage, you can get really good results. Um, and this was from an individual that was live trapped in the southern Coromandels. What have we done with that? This is largely what I'm going to talk about today, which is more about population connectivity. How can we use this to understand populations? GBS, genotyping by sequencing, what you do is you chop up the genome at, into little bits at a certain uh, sequence, so it would be TGCC or whatever. Every time you get that, you chop it and then you sequence the bit next to it. What that means is that you're only sequencing about 1% of the genome, but it's the same 1% in all of the individuals, and you can compare that between them. You don't need to know all the details of that. It just produces variable markers that we can look at relatedness. And this is based on the genome. <clears throat> so during my PhD, I used 17 uh, genetic markers to assess how they move, including around the Auckland region, and uh, to islands, and that was my PhD work. Now with the current stuff that I've been doing, I've used 30,000 markers on Waiheke Island, 
And the reason that that's lower than the 56,000 on Taranak in Taranaki is because they're super inbred in, on Waiheke Island. Um, and can genetically determine sex and This is completely changing what we can do <coughs> with genetics. Now, this is just, uh, you guys all know this. Auckland is about 3k from Rangapoko, and Waiheke Island's 5.2 kilometers offshore. And just briefly talking about this, so there were a number of soats caught on Rangatoto Mototapu over the last few years. And the last one, what happened was they caught it, uh, they, they knew where it was, they couldn't catch it. They eventually, uh, this was um, Doc, made this uh, set up. So it's all out of driftwood because it wasn't going to go into a, a box, doesn't like boxes. So we make it out of driftwood. Then they added stoat scent, they added calls from some stoat kits at the correct time of year that they would be wanting to mate. And they added so female stoat bedding and a penguin egg. Got the stoat. <laughs> That's what eradication is, is when you can spend $10,000 trying to get one stoat. <laughs> now, using the genetics, um, I was able to show that the recent incursions, there were three caught, were unrelated to each other. All of them swam out independently from Auckland, three kilometers. They swam, they didn't get there by boat, so to swim. Um, and in general, they probably, the recent ones came from uh, East Auckland, I'm guessing probably up the Tamaki River, Browns Island, and then across. Uh, and these are stoats that were, so the west, I don't know why all of the things have just been squashed like that. And, anyway, so those are all Ark in the Park stoats that some of you may have given me. Um, so I've been getting stoats from around the Auckland region, and you can tell where a stoat is from based on this genetics. So thank you for bringing in manky old stoats and sticking them in freezers for me. It is very useful, and there's a lot of ongoing research using these for various things, and there's also work on weasels happening as well that I'm involved in. So, hurrying on, Waiheke stoat genetics. Um, that's the trap network on Waiheke Island. Yeah. So, eradication is different from control. Uh, basically, I said there's possibilities with the Fjordland Islands that some of them are just missing traps, um, and that might be why they are failing, those programs. So, have a 250 by 250 meter grid, and they did it, which is amazing. Interestingly, not all traps are created equal. These are the number of stoats that I have been given from Waiheke Island traps that have caught a stoat. You'll notice that one has caught uh, 24 stoats and the next highest is about 5. This one magical trap is at, at the end of a causeway uh, next to the mangroves and we don't really know why it's so special and catches every stoat. Uh, I think it's sort of large landscape beaches, they just go to that one point. And so that's why it's so good. But this is something that's really important, is that microhabitat getting exactly the right placement. So if you have a soap trap that has not caught anything for a year, you could just move it even up to 10 to 20 meters. You know, small optimization could lead to a big change because some traps are in exactly the right spot. You need to get in that spot. Uh, they have obviously, during summer you get lots of stoats. Um, which is all the juveniles, and over um, sort of spring, late winter, you get no females. Their home range shrinks, and they don't like to go into anything new. But the males, and this is an interesting thing, because I've been aging them all, uh, males, you start to get males that are one to two years old. They've been avoiding traps that whole time in September because they're trying to mate. So it's really interesting, they start moving out of their home range and they go into interacting with novel things. Uh, interestingly with the genetics, so this is doing genome-wide diversity and again you've got Auckland which is actually a combination of the Panuas and uh, the Waitakaris because they were about the same. Uh, this is an inbreeding coefficient, um, so they're less inbred as they go down. Uh, you can see Auckland is similar to Taranaki, Taranaki is slightly less inbred. In truth, stoats were actually introduced around the Wellington region and they moved up so that makes sense. Um, but 
the most inbred stoat in the whole of Auckland, mainland, is about the average on Waiheke Island. So this is a really good thing because it means that if you remove stoats from Waiheke Island, they're not coming back anytime soon. It was potentially founded by a pregnant female. This is a very low immigration rate. So, good. And that, this is what it looks like uh, in another way. This is a heat map of relatedness. So the darker, the more related things. You can see there's two different things happening here. There's the Auckland and then the Waiheke Island ones. Now, trying to get something more out of this data, uh, this is looking at genetic distance, this dot plot here. Uh, so gen genomic distance, the ones that are in that yellow box are highly related, so this is parent offspring or full siblings, and then distance from each other when they were tracked. This is on Waiheke Island, and then I just took those ones and I said, well, what's the distribution of the close kin? And you get lots that are close together. They often go into the same track. But then you have the secondary peak at about three and a half kilometers. And so what seems to happen is the stoats, when they're dispersing, they sort of run away from parents, and then they get to about three and a half kilometers. And go, are there any stoats around here? No, this is a good place to stay at home. And then they might go into a track. So they don't go in during the dispersal part. They settle, and then they do that, which is novel information. It's very hard, because you can't put radio collars on these things and track them easily. Juvenile stoats are very hard to work with. But you also see 12K. Some of them are going 12K through that network. And the island's only 20K across, so they're basically able to run laps on it. Now, uh, unsolicited dick pics of stoats. So I've got all the baculums. These are the penis bones, and you can actually get the exact age from that. So, and that's what that graph looks like. This is actual you know, ecological data that has a really high R squared value, which you almost never get. It's wonderful. Um, so I've been aging every single soap. Obviously with females, they don't have this, so I have to do skull measurements and it's less good, but still. So I've been trying to get the age and all the genetic information from every single soap. This is what Waiheke looks like overall, ignoring the rest of the country. And you can see, uh, so that's on the diagonal, it's comparing self versus self, so they should be red. And you get these nice big uh, orange box structures. These are highly related individuals. They're litters. And on the other side, so I've highlighted the ones that were caught after September 2020. Um, and so you can see there are a few. Now, there's two older males. They weren't born then. And so then I was able to calculate, OK, there's between three and five litters that were born a uh, year before last, or no, no, last year. So they're down to very low numbers. Probably there are only up to five females that bred last year. And this is just looking at some of the dispersal. So the red ones were earlier, and uh, this is actually, so there were two litters that shared one individual. Uh, the red ones were caught earlier in 2020, and then this orange one was caught in November. A couple of days later, a male was caught in the same trap. So that was actually, that was the daughter in the first litter. Then she was caught, uh, but she gave birth, and then one of her sons went into the same trap because of the smell of her being there. And then her litter dispersed across the island. And that's 7.2 kilometers. So one of her kits, she died when they were quite young, dispersed 7.2 kilometers across all of those traps and then got caught four months later. So this is what's happening on Waiheke Island right now. And this is uh, some work that I presented to them recently. Uh, these, this is a litter that was born. So dad's uh, been caught earlier. He's yellow. And then this is the litter, but mum was never caught. And I know because I've done the genetics of every single stoat caught on that island for four years. Mum was never caught. So I said, well, probably what you need to do is uh, bring out dogs and find her because she will have another litter this year. So I presented this slide to them. So then they brought the dogs out. And exactly where I put the marker, they found a den. And they've since caught uh, one of the stoats. So this is actually probably one of her offspring that was up here. And that's now, it was live trapped. It's gone to Lancare Research for behavioral research to find out about how stoats that avoid traps for years 
act so that we can catch those ones because we don't care about dumb ones we want to get, catch the smart ones but this is great results going from i sequence all the genomes of all the stoats to go look with a dog just there and find it Whee! <laughs> So in summary, between three and five litters born last year on Waiheke Island. Some females, I believe, were unmated, which is basically impossible uh, for stoats because they're always mated, which means that there were no males in some parts of the island during the mating season. Uh, males and females are avoiding traps for years because I know because I've got individuals that are several years old that are there, uh, and they are Waiheke stoats. And scent appears like it's really important. So if I had a fresh dead stoat and I was in a stoat trapping thing, I would rub it around the outside of other traps. It will potentially uh, add to the trapping rates. And they are looking right now. But the thing is, so this is incredibly close to eradication. It's also incredibly close to failure. Okay. So... I will just go through Taranaki really briefly. Uh, they've also been trying to do this, and I've been looking at dispersal of them, and they're going 40 kilometers across a similarly dense network. So basically, this is how stoats move, and they are avoiding things. You cannot actually trap stoats to extinction. I don't think that we'll ever do it. It requires toxin. Um, and possums are much better. They have, this is, looking at things, they can't go across rivers, so possums are much better than stoats. Stoats basically just, you know, they can swim five kilometers, they can go 65 kilometers, incredibly difficult. So I will briefly do this. Uh, the thing is that I don't think we're actually able to eradicate uh, stoats without aerial toxin. It is impossible. Waiheke might, it's got zero immigration and you can see what efforts they're going into and other ones are doing good suppression but we really need to research something because right now I think that you know this is our moonshot and we're funding people to you know build human pyramids trying to get to the moon it won't work we need rockets and there is no way to eradicate stoats currently um, and so we need magical new t tools, and uh, I'm trying to work on those, but it's a long way away. And I'll leave that slide up, but this is not all me, you know, all my work. There's a lot of people that went into this. So, yes, thank you, and have a nice question.